the area. You can see the bones that had been strewn along the way by the grave robbers who weren't interested in the bones at all, but in the artifacts that they could dig out to sell. Uh, in these tombs, you see amazing preservation, even of flesh parts. Uh, in an area where it hasn't rained for a hundred years, uh, the dryness of the desert is excellent for preservation. But in these tombs, you can see the remains of the mummies. This is a trophy head that was worn on the belt by this brutal culture. In one of the nearby museums, you see the skulls with a hole in the head. This means that was a, a trophy head. It had been worn by somebody who had evidently killed them in battle. But as we look at these tombs, we see often babies with mothers. Maybe if the mother died, they couldn't take care of the babies. And uh, I, I don't know the whole story, but it doesn't look like a, a nice story. Uh, here we see one of the well-preserved mummies together with a number of bones that have been found in the area. And in this particular tomb, you see one of the burial stones in situ, in place. And you see this uh, on a number of occasions. Here's another one of the burial stones beside one of the mummies uh, with a dinosaur on it. This one was excavated in 2005. The drawing here shows what's seen on it, not as uh, dramatically clear as with some of them, but it can be seen very clearly. It has been examined carefully by a number of laboratories, and we see the close-up of some of the carvings showing the patina uh, in the grooves, also testifying to its antiquity. Uh, this was one that was excavated in 2006 that uh, is in a collection that I own. This is about a 70-pound stone. It has three dinosaurs on it. It was from about 100 miles away from the Paracas Peninsula, and uh, the carving style is slightly different. You can see uh, the teeth are raised uh, rather than incised. Uh, the bias relief is in evidence here, but the same style, uh, again, depicting the dinosaurs. Many say, well, Cabrera uh, was a strange fellow, and we can't depend on his testimony. Well, uh, I think he was a very credible witness, but we have many, many different sources. Notice that the first one is the Spanish priest. Uh, who in 1525 described these stones, and there have been several reports of this. The chronicler of the Incas wrote of these stones in 1570. Uh, in detail, they found the stones with the strange animals on them. And then uh, uh, Bolivia Cabrera, the grandfather, of uh, the one that we worked with there, began collecting the stones in the 30s. And then Javier Cabrera continued the collection uh, amassing some 11,000 of the stones. He was professor of medicine at the University of Lima, head of the Department of Medicine for 20 years. He established the largest teaching hospital in Peru and retired to be cultural anthropologist for Inca. This is not a lightweight in terms of a witness, but if you want to ignore him, there are many others. There's Carlos Solti, who excavated the stones at Ocoquehi in the 50s, uh, Pablo Solti, who is his brother, donated the stones to the museum in 1968. The museum denied it, promised to show them to us if we met their conditions, and then refused, and, but then finally did reveal them. Yes, they have them there. And then Basilio Achua of Okakehi excavated a number of the stones. The Aeronautical Museum displays many of the stones today, as does the Regional Museum in Nazca. Um, I, together with Dr. Swift, have observed them in the tombs, in C2. University of Bonn uh, in Germany has confirmed the oxidized patina in a number of the stones, and grave robbers continue to excavate these carved stones. You can still dig them up. Now, that's an impressive array of confirmation. And if you don't like uh, Dr. Cabrera, then okay, <laughs> toss him out. You still have an impressive array of confirmation. In addition to the stones, we find in the tombs other things that display the dinosaurs, like the textiles, the burial cloths that were associated with them. Many of them show the dinosaur motif, as do the, the vases, uh, the pottery. This is in the National Museum in Lima, under, it has a sign circa 2,500 years before present. 
Uh, and then the, the Moshi vases, very famous for their style, uh, inability to reproduce them. Uh, they're showing clearly dinosaurs. And then some of the gold death masks that were found up in northern Peru likewise show the dinosaurs. Notice the dermal frills on the back, the huge teeth, the tail curving up over their back on either side of the face here. Uh, it's obvious that the people of Peru were seeing dinosaurs from their vases and their death masks and their textiles as well as the thousands of stones that can be seen today. I, I think that's just really irrefutable evidence. Now, let's travel to Bolivia. Here we see the capital of Bolivia, La Paz, one of the highest cities in the world, and there is very interesting evidence here. The Amante Indians, as they're called, uh, are the natives that were here before the Spaniards arrived. And when we look at their traditions, uh, we look at the history uh, that they all are aware of, at least from their folklore, it's, it's uh, very interesting. They all know of the Viracosa, the sky god, the creator god, who sent his son to die for the sins of the world. And they were looking for the return of his son. They know about Tomas, the man with the book. Uh, it's interesting that a lot of Christians think that, uh, yes, the, the gospel was preached to the whole world, but uh, they don't believe the whole world <laughs> had the gospel preached to it. And uh, I think we see evidence that some of them came to this part of the country. Most of the Amante live up on the barren plain, the Altiplano, which is a huge plain uh, over 180 miles long and about 60 miles wide. Uh, that's almost 14,000 feet in the air. That thin air is very difficult to make a living in, but they do, uh, mostly growing potatoes uh, in very ingenious ways. Here's one of the Amante women who's returned from uh, about a 20 kilometer trek to go to the grocery store. Uh, it's a very difficult life. We talked with a number of them and each of them told us of the knowledge of uh, Veracosa, the sky god. Yes, they, they knew about that and many of them are uh, polygamous. They worship uh, idols and they make sacrifices to those idols. But they also know that in the past that wasn't the case and that there was the worship of the one true creator god in the past. We're reminded of Acts chapter 1 where Jesus told the apostles that you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, even to the remotest parts of the earth. I think we see evidence of that when we see Tomas, man of the book. There are statues, there are paintings of him. Uh, show him in, in this long robe, the attire of the first century, with the codex under his arm. Uh, evidently he came here and taught. Notice the statement by William Prescott who comments on the evidence for this. He's the atheist, the one who is certainly no creationist. In his book, Conquest of Peru, he says it's a remarkable fact that many, if not most, of the rude tribes inhabiting the vast American continent, however disfigured their creeds may have been in other respects by childish superstition, had attained to the sublime conception of the one great spirit, the creator of the universe. And now this, this is not many, he said, many if not most, had attained to this concept, the creator God, who was not to be dishonored at attempt at visual representation. He would not allow idolatry. But this is true in the backgrounds, he says, of most of the people of South America. And then he talks about some of the things uh, that they have in their culture. Among the traditions of importance is one of the deluge, which they held in common with so many nations in all parts of the globe. And then he says Orthodox Spaniards who first came to the country saw striking resemblance to Christian communion. They were practicing uh, probably a polluted form, but a form of the communion which he goes on to say was evidence that some of the primitive teachers of the gospel, perhaps an apostle himself, had paid a visit to these distant regions and scattered over them the seeds of religious, or religious truth. Now he would use truth in an accommodative sense because he's not a believer that this is the truth, but nevertheless sees evidence that there was an apostle here and that Christianity was planted here at an early time 
and that they were expecting the son of the creator God to come. I, I think this is interesting information from an atheist. We travel to Lake Titicaca, a very interesting area which straddles the border between Peru and Bolivia. Uh, here we see people who make a living often uh, weaving these uh, reed boats, some of them very large and uh, much larger than this, some of them, and uh, it's an amazing similarity that can be demonstrated between these boats and those that we find in Egypt made of exactly the same material, the same style. I think it's obvious that there was a connection here, and Contiki helped to demonstrate that we mentioned earlier. Notice the, the description that we find here in U.S. News and World Report. Uh, Alan uh, Collada and his colleagues, University of Chicago,